All right, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today with the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, today is March 19th, a little bit after 3 p.m., and we appreciate you taking time out uh, from this uh, Saturday afternoon to come in and meet with us. Uh, I know some of you are joining us from Dave Stetson's class. Uh, he's in the middle of his workshop uh, on uh, the bag lady and her gentleman friend, and uh, thank you for joining us right after that class. I uh, just want to remind you all that uh, there's another workshop that's coming up. Uh, Janet Cordell is going to have a workshop in May. It's the one, the only one that I see listed out on Wood Carving Academy. Uh, it's on May the 9th. It's carving a bighorn sheep. So if you're interested in signing up for that, uh, make sure you reach out to Janet Cordell and uh, get signed up for that. Um, today on our meeting, we're going to be doing a giveaway. Uh, the giveaway is for Wood Carving Academy. Uh, it's a one month subscription to the giveaway or to the, uh, to the Wood Carving Academy website. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to sign up for that, uh, Tom's gonna pl place the link to our link tree out in the chat. Uh, you can go there and you can click on the link to uh, go in and still sign up for that. Uh, you can do that until about, so I don't know, about 3.30. We're gonna cut it off at 3.30. Uh, we'll do the drawing for the Wood Carving Academy, Academy certificate at the end of the meeting. So if you haven't signed up, make sure you do that during this meeting. Uh, and that way we can get you in the drawing. I uh, wanted to thank um, Rich and Holly from Helvey. Uh, Helvey um, usually over here, uh, usually donates knives to us as a sponsorship to our meetings. Uh, we did a uh, auction last week. We're gonna do another auction coming up on April the 9th with Joe Yu when Joe Yu comes on. Uh, so look forward to that, but we wanna thank them for all their support. Uh, they're good to donate knives to us and we use the uh, proceeds to that to continue to have these meetings. So just want to reach out and say thanks to Helvey and Rich and Holly there. Uh, if you get a chance, they're going to be in uh, Charlotte in a couple of weeks. Uh, the Charlotte show is coming up at the beginning of April on the, uh, the second and third. Uh, if you're looking for a knife and you're in the area, make sure you go down to that meeting. Again, they'll be set up there. And I think they're going to set up also at the Carving the Rocky show in September. Uh, if you're able to come out to that, that's the first uh, annual CCA Carbon the Rocky show. Uh, we're going to have Chris Hammock that's going to be coming on talking about that with some of the other CCA members on April the 16th. Uh, so make sure you tune in for that. And if you're able to get to that show again, that's in September on the 24th and 25th. Uh, I'll go through some of the other presenters at the end of the meeting. Uh, today, we want to get right into our presentation. Uh, today, we have on Ray Meyer. He's going to come on uh, from New York, he's gonna be talking about how he carved spiral Santas. Um, he uh, was first introduced to this and I'll let him tell a little bit more about it uh, from an article that was in Wood Carving Illustrated that Leonard Watts did. Uh, he's gonna talk through that process and, and do a little bit of a demonstration on that. Uh, so Ray, I appreciate you taking time out to join us today. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the meeting over to you. And again, we'll do the drawing for the, uh, the giveaway for Wood Carving Academy at the end of the meeting. And I'll tell you about uh, what's going to be coming up in the coming weeks. So, Ray, I'll go ahead and turn this over to you at this point. Okay, good. Hi. I've been uh, wood carving for about three years now. Uh, got into it because of a injury I had to my leg. I had to do some uh, physical therapy. I always wanted to wood carve and tried a couple times and just didn't have the right knife for Right instruction and sitting there watching a Doug Linker video on YouTube. And uh, he put a couple lines on a block of wood and turned it into a uh, ornament, the most fantastically simple carving ever. Um, I also watched his um, Simple Santa, where he, uh, I think that was done by Bob Kay. I'm not going to try to butcher his name. Um, so my first attempt was this here. Got to hold that up. And you can see that's pretty ugly. I started watching Sharon Mahart and Gene Messer. Carved up a couple little guys. And then uh, I did trees, uh, the um, happy little Christmas tree. I did a six inch sand at its flat back, similar to the uh, Spiral Santa, and I'd done about 30 of them one day because I was laid off with the pandemic. And I said, I had a little scrap of wood there, and I said, one how small I can go. So I punched him out, and 
posted a picture on Facebook and next thing I know, I sold six or so pairs of earrings that size. Sent a picture to my club president of what I'd been up to. And he sent me the article from Leonard Watts. And he said, see if you can do one of these. So three hours later, I sent him back a picture of that. I wasn't painted, but that's what we're going to attempt to do today. And if anybody's got any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. If you write them down, someone's going to have to read them to me because I'm going to be a little busy with a knife in my hands. Most important thing, I usually start off with a block of wood that's about six inches long and inch and a quarter thick. I believe this one is a little bigger. If I want to resize it, the biggest I've ever made it is 18 inches. I turn it into a fraction. So if I want a length of 18 inches, I compare 18 to six and the width of the block, which is about an inch and a quarter, to the width of the piece I want, and I have to start off with a three and a half inch wide piece. But this one's about inch and a half, I believe, and around six inches long. I strike center lines top and bottom, all the way down. And that right triangle right there is one of the most important things you can put on there. Because if you forget to do that, and you go through all of the work and you get all the way down to here, and you look up and you don't have a nose, it's very disheartening. I've been there, done that. Not fun. The other thing I did not put on this layout is where the hat brim is gonna go. Um, you could measure it. I usually just look at what looks good. I used to be very concerned with the dimensions and not so much anymore. Now, all of these center lines are very important because you can't lay out the spiral without those to start with from here, but we'll get to that. Another line you wanna add is here on the top. If you wanna make the style of hat I make, I usually put it parallel with the face. You could set it any other way, depending on which way you want the hat to flop, but I, usually do this, unless I carve it back off of that and then I put it somewhere else. But I haven't, I think I only made that mistake once. We wanna get started on this cause there's a bit of work here. Notice I forgot to put in that most important cut first. I use the center line to kind of judge when we hit round, except up here by the nose, I'm a little more judicious about that because we need some material left for the face. I don't get too carried away with the face until after I cut the spiral because that you're dealing with a very small piece of wood, very easy to snap off and you wouldn't want to waste a lot of time making a face if you don't have a spiral to go with it. It'd look mighty funny without the spiral.
keep going like that till you get this to look like this. Get the deck off. That was bad. Then we want to transfer these lines around because we do not want to cut off the bottom of his face. I believe we call this hogging the wood off. If I was making a spoon, we'd be doing this with a draw knife. Work on that till we get it down to about this point. Take off the gloves because we've got to do a little right now. measure this up and we want a number easy to divide so we'll pick three carry this line around That's where your spiral is going to end the most important center points need to come back up on the body of the ornament And then we just sketch them into place. Forgot one. So are you dividing that into quarters, Ray? What are you doing there? Yes, we are. On those original center points that we uh, laid out in the beginning. And we then take that line and divide that into quarters. At one and a half, at three quarter, and three quarter. One and a half, three quarter, Three quarter. Just in case anybody's not familiar with working a six inch ruler backwards. I'm pretty familiar with this ruler. I've been using it for 35 years. Now that we have that laid out, the start of the spiral goes from here that first quarter here to the next one down here to the next one down and from here to the next one down and back up step over one set of lines If you can't draw a straight line, you can take a ribbon and wrap it around there. But due to arthritis in my hands, they are not nimble enough to do that. So I do much better just kind of sketching this in. And you're gonna be cutting this with a knife. So 
you don't have to worry about having a pin straight line. We are imitating an icicle after all, after all. And if any of your lines look crooked when you're cutting them, just straighten them out with your knife. That keeps going till it looks like this. Oh, no, yeah, I'm gonna skip that part, sorry. Wasn't thought out well enough. Now you put in all your main spiral. It's halfway between that point and that point, which is just about there, and it doesn't have to be exact. You split these lines. You could put layout lines on there if you wanted, but this is going to get pretty confusing. That looks a little thin, so I want to bring that down. And land somewhere in there. Instead of spinning this around again, we'll just start up here. Anybody have any questions about this so far? Okay, we don't need to waste a whole lot of time on that. That will end up looking like that. I have found that it occasionally helps to put a mark where you're gonna remove material because it's bad to carve this out and then step over to this one and start carving it and lose your icicle. So put on the protection again, Turn the table off. Cause that's just rocking around. Check out these. And a dockyard tools, very handy for these. I don't own any veiners, they might work. I've never tried them. We've only been at it three years and we haven't um, fully encompassed all of our uh, carving. But I cut along that line and I try to keep the knife perpendicular as possible to the surface. And I start cutting in on that. Take the gouge. And you pick a gouge that's pretty close to the width of the line you're working on. That's why I like the dock yards, because as the lines get closer together, you can use the next size down gouge. And you notice if you were to do this without cutting that line, you're going with the grain on this side here, you're going against the grain over here. So it, it behooves you and I take the gouge at the top here and I kind of form a circle by pushing straight in. I wear the glove on both sides because things get a little tight here. I found myself when I did these and this section of doing this alone took almost a hundred minutes. So we made a few examples and we won't bore you with going through this whole process to get all the way down to the, but I find that the key to this whole thing is remembering to put that nose in and laying this out. Because when I attempted to do it the way the wood carving illustrated instructions said to do it, it made no sense to me. So I thought a couple minutes and figured out how I could wrap it around that tapered shaft. And this was my solution. I did not understand the instructions in Wood Carving Illustrated at all. But this made sense to me mechanically. I'm 
don't have anybody ever let you say that a dockyard tool is not tough because I'm leaning on that little thing pretty good. Watching this is about as exciting as grass growing, I would imagine. So Ray, it seems like you do a lot of Santas. Is there a reason why you kind of stick with Santa Claus or is it just something you like to carve? Um, it's the first thing I tried. And I learned my faces bit by bit. Meaning I started off with a very simple face inspired by Doug and Sharon Myort and Gene Messer. And I added details to it and I've, it seems to have helped me that I've done repetition upon repetition. Um, and I, my wife, when I post them on Facebook, people offer to buy them. I, I don't actively sell them anywhere. I give some of them away as gifts. I um, personally want to try the, uh, I have the Jack Price book. Um, uh, miniature characters that go into the 35 millimeter film canister. I want to uh, get into that. I um, also like, I'm going to butcher his name, Matt Catterstan's book on uh, faces and heads. I started on that. Um, I've taken a couple classes with uh, one class with Dave Stetson. Um, I have a lot of work to do on his Klaus. Um, I did a I've tried to apply some of the lessons he taught about drawing because I don't seem to be able to visualize what I want to do until I start cutting it. Um, I've made a gnome. I'm going to show you a quick picture of him that he was drawn off of a uh, cartoon thing I found on, my wife found on Pinterest. And I drew him up, worked some details out of him and he turned out okay. Uh, when I get as time allows, I'm going to uh, work on him some more. That, you know, drawing it first and then actually working it into a uh, model. Uh, but 19 of those gnomes have sold. So sometimes working on my technique gets in the way of people wanting to buy my carvings, which pay for my hobby. So I kind of am balancing where my time gets spent. And my wife enjoys giving away my carvings as gifts to her friends and coworkers, and which sometimes leads to more sales. So there are other things I want to uh, carve besides Santa. And since they all look like my uh, one older brother, he uh, would kind of like me to find a different face to carve. Hence the books on by Matt Catterston and I. Um, I have a book by Dave Stetson also. Can't off the top of my head remember the title. I should have been a little bit more prepared with that, but I um, kind of want to develop my own style. And I you know, try to work on that in between making pieces for people that want to buy them. Now, as you're doing this curve here, it's very hard to keep the knife perpendicular. And because of the grain, it pays you to turn around and cut the other way on that one side to follow the grain. You really don't want your knife blade to run away with you at this point. Because you're talking about less than three eighths of an inch of a not very tough hardwood. It keeps your fingers healthy.
And as you get down in here, you will hear some ugly crunching noises as you get close to breaking through. We're a ways away from that. But this spoon kind of shape on this dockyard tool kind of allows you to work in this round section here. Um, I just found them very handy. To be honest with you, I bought them more as a novelty than a, a anything else. And I'm really quite surprised at how well I, they work and how often I use them. They're nice when I'm making little tiny faces for eye sockets and uh, around the nose. None of the parts I can remember right now. I get more interested in the technique than I do the uh, Latin names of my face parts. And my brother keeps telling me that's why I don't wear my glasses to bed at night so I don't have to look at that mug when I get up in the morning. He hasn't unfriended me on Facebook, but as you can see, we did get through there in one spot. You don't make the slip first, you have to be a little careful with the gouge. I'm gonna switch to slitting and we're gonna make a mess of our project here on the internet. So Ray, a couple questions in the chat. Um, are you just gonna carve that till you reach the center or are you gonna to try to carve all the way through? No, I, um, I go for the breakthrough, it makes it easier working down but it also makes it dangerous because the gouge can go through into your hand. So it's a, because these are directly across from one another, but I usually get an opening before I start advancing down the piece because you have to keep changing chisel diameters as you go down the spiral. So you, this five millimeter will work here for a while and then soon I'll be to the four and I think all the way down to the, it's either a two or a three. I don't remember off the top of my head. Not three. And then somebody asked how long it takes to carve one. Did you say 100 minutes? Oh, just the spiral alone takes 100 minutes. Okay. So what are you thinking? A couple of hours for a whole project? I would probably say two and a half. And then that doesn't include the painting. Gotcha. And I'm not a very sophisticated painter because... I'm working on my carving technique and the painting part I think will come. I want to experiment with the washed out or the um, acrylic wash type painting and layering. But as I say, my wife keeps selling stuff and it's selling the way it is. And I've been spraying shellac on it to protect them because somebody pays money for it. I don't want them chipping the paint off. Uh, it's a little shiny for my taste. I may switch to a matte finish, but I have uh, four cans of shellac to get rid of first. And then I'll find something else to uh, spray them with. I have made some uh, other things that I, I like a more tactile feel to. I came down with COVID last year and there were about 10 families that were exceedingly Nice to me, checking on, make sure I was still alive because I was home alone. My wife was in the hospital with it, uh, delivering food, um, medicine, uh, medical supplies. And I found a very folk style angel and I carved them up what I call the COVID angel as a thank you for their uh, efforts while I was laid up. And a couple of friends of mine came down with breast cancer and I switched that to a COVID angel. I made them little pins that they could pin on their shirt or I made them smaller so that they could put them in their pocket to rub on or like a comfort bird, but a comfort angel. And um, they've become very popular. 
my wife's boss is suffering, her daughter's suffering with some medical conditions. So I made her and her daughter one. Um, they were very appreciative of it. So, uh, and that was um, oil, linseed oil, let that dry. And I did uh, Howard's feed and wax, but they had no facets on them. I sanded them smooth to uh, 400 grit because I wanted it something that had a very tactile feel to it and uh, gave comfort. I uh, Hey Ray, I wanted to I wanted to tell you your your screen and everything is really clear. It's easy to see what you're doing. Thank you. We uh, have a less than one year old iMac computer. Um, I have a tripod from a laser level, and that's just my cell phone. It's nothing fancy. I'm not a technology expert in any stretch of the imagination, as Dave and Tom can attest to on the setup for this show. While I'm not around, they're probably giggling behind my back. That's why I don't feel bad about picking on Dave. Tom didn't hand me any ammo. I also carve in the front seat of my car with a steering wheel in a way, so that's how I know how to keep my hands in one place. And this, uh, coffee table has been, um, TV tray has been with me through three surgeries that I recovered from on the couch in the last three years. So I'm kind of used to staying over the top of it or a cookie sheet. Doctor had so much fun replacing my right knee that he ended up having to go back in there in less than six months and clean up some crap that he left behind or something. So he's no longer my doctor. Ray, it's Daniel from Grand Bend. I'm just curious, did you uh, tune up your tools before you started today? Or and do you make a habit of tuning up? Yes, I do. And yes, I did. There are one, two, three, four, five knives beside this one in my hand that are there if this thing gets dull, because I don't think you want to watch me tune up my tools. But uh, Wednesday, I went through every one that I thought I would use and tuned it up. I usually go... Um, uh, this is cutting pretty good. I, it's, I don't feel any dragging. Definitely, if I feel a drag, I, I tune up the tools. I, I uh, had a father who was a master carpenter on uh, penthouses and stuff in the city. Uh, the company is, he was with, he actually did Joe Namus Penthouse. And you weren't allowed to use his tools till you could put an edge on them. And there was something fascinating about me just pushing a plane through a pine board and watching those shavings roll out. I think I've planed a million feet of pine into paper thin shavings. And like I said, you couldn't, you couldn't do that if you didn't know how to take care of what you were using. So I fully believe in a sharp tool. It, if you make a mistake, it'll hurt you bad, but you're less likely to make a mistake because you don't put excessive force on it, except I am putting a lot of force on that little gouge. Um, but that's where I came up with my obsession for sharp tools. My pocket knives, you, before I started carving, you could usually shave with them. Because to me, a knife is not at all useful to you if it doesn't have a good edge. Ray, are you a retired railroad guy? 
Nope. The style of hat my father started me off with when I was 12 years old, working on his house. And the overalls came along with it because when he was a young union carpenter, you could tell what local the guys were, what branch the guys were in by the color of their overalls. And the carpenter's overalls were either blue or striped. And I, up until last week, still had my original striped overalls upstairs with the sewn in nail pockets. I got used to wearing them. I found them very handy. I've always had a job where I could wear them. Um, I just found them very comfortable. So what uh, happened last week that you got rid of them? Oh, uh, that, <laughs> that original pair of overalls? Well, when I got married, I was six foot Did three and a hundred. No, I was, let me finish the story. I was <laughs> six foot three and 189 pounds and six months later I was six foot three and 315 pounds and I've turned myself back to 250 or 260 but when you were less than 200 pounds those overalls didn't fit no more and thread rotted out in them and I needed the closet space because they just bought me six brand new pair so out they went Now we're getting to the dangerous part here, because as you can see, we can see through there. So we need to lighten up a little bit and rough this down. You always want to switch that around so you're cutting with the grain, because your knife will go through this in a heartbeat. It's also very disheartening when you're picking your piece, try to pick wood without a check. I uh, gave a demonstration from a wood carving club and we weren't careful on the selection of pieces. Oh, we missed something and one of the carvers carved into a, a wood check, which was kind of disheartening because he spent a couple hours working very hard and diligently on his piece. And then it was just, I'm, Personally, I would have glued it because you didn't break it. You just carved into a check. But for your first piece, you wouldn't want to do that. You want to do it without harming it. Okay, we're about done with that knife. And when we're carving this normally, I don't usually have six knives lined up. I'd sharpen that one. So, you know, this one may be done in under 90 minutes because, like I said, there's six knives waiting ready to go. I would have taken a break and stropped it up and it had been fine, but. Patience is a virtue when you're doing this, by the way. My brother says only doctors have patience, but. Got a little bit too uh, wide for the area we're working in. I am amazed at how long these dockyard gouges hold their edges. I would imagine I'm using them a little bit past their design specifications, but they don't let me down. 
Do you find them difficult to, to uh, sharpen? No, I got actually the strop that um, my club sells. I think it was from the glove guy. I'm not really absolutely positive about that, but it, no, I'm sorry. There, there's a kit where you can sharpen them. It, it may be from the glove guy. I'm not positive. There was a label on it and I don't honestly remember. And that's what I use to keep them tuned up. It comes with its own paste and uh, grooves cut in the block to uh, match the shapes. If I did not have that, I would have made up a block when the tools were sharp. Right. And use that profile to maintain the factory edge. I haven't had to stone any of them at all. I'm pretty good at not dropping sharp tools for the most part. Because I really don't like power sharpening. I just find it a easier way to make faster mistakes. I can make mistakes in slow motion just fine and are easier to fix. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. No problem. Tom, I believe you heard you ask about my hat. It's a very handy place to keep the pencil. That's why it was originally there. Why Pop picked this shape, I have no idea. He was not one to be argued with, though. He was a natural carver. He wasn't a very good teacher because he'd tell you, he'd hand you a block of wood and say, yeah, just take everything off that doesn't look like whatever you want. Nothing about changing the knife bevels on your pocket knife or so. How we fix for time? We're sitting about 45 minutes in. So you got a bit. You're good, brother. All right. Well, I don't want to waste the whole time on eating out the spiral because we definitely have enough another step up. I think everybody's got the general idea of what this is going to look like. I'm assuming I'm staying in frame pretty good. Doing very well, man. Keep it going. Thank you. And hopefully I'm going to get some sleep tonight because I've been laying up for two days thinking about this. i to make a fool of myself on the internet. You're doing great, Ray. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was just Dave Stetson that did that. Uh, I've been in one of his classes. I'm looking forward to taking more. I checked him out on Wood Carbon Academy, too. I, um, because I, I honestly want to get better and I want to develop my own style. I just don't want to be able to carve my brother's face or something I saw another carver do. Um, I, I'm not really an original thinker. I'm much better at seeing something and figuring out a way to make it, which is pretty much how this ornament arrived. My club president kind of threw down a challenge of Oh, you think you're pretty good at making Santa? I give this a go. And, uh, it turned out fairly well, I think. Um, one guy I learned a lot off about making eyes and how to get them on a on a head properly that would help a lot of people who are not good at it is Ruben Yanos on YouTube. He has a uh, five or six part video series. And he's basically a stone carver and wood sculptor. And talk about making a realistic looking eye. He even shows you how to do the technique that Gustav Borglin used on Mount Rushmore. I don't remember, it has a particular name of making a solid eye look uh, lifelike. And I don't remember the name of the technique, but he shows you how to do it. I haven't tried it yet. I'm still pretty happy when I get both eyes looking the same. But it's, it's something to shoot for. And the reason I ended up on his page is that guy wanted that 18 inch Santa. 
and I couldn't send an 18 inch antenna out with crappy eyes. So I spent 10 hours on Saturday with watching Ruben Yano's videos over and over until I got what I call a reasonable eye. And then I cheated and made a oak tag template with both eyes the same size on either side of the separation of the face. So I could just trace on where I wanted the eyes. And that's how I started making eyes. Um, I've now, from listening to Dave Stetson and um, the May Best, Roger and Ellen, I believe her name is, Roger Siegel, I've tried, and Doug Winker, of course, tried uh, making more complex eyes with less cheating of templates. Um, some of them people may not want to admit to what I'm making as an eye, but I'm a work in progress. Ray, there's a question in the chat whether or not you could do the spiral with just a knife. Um, with a lot of patients, I would think so. Um, I hadn't never had the confidence in my knifing abilities to pull that off. Um, <clears throat> but I may give it a try now that I know it's a challenge, but not today. You'd, you'd have to work pretty hard, I would think. Because once you're in that deep, trying to cut down and then turn a knife to get in would be hard. And you have to remember that those pieces have to come out of this spiral. Um, if you have kind of like a ball in a cage, but if you'd have made it an icicle inside of that icicle, you now can't hold it and have to cut it into smaller pieces to get it out. Uh, it, interesting challenge. I um, haven't wrapped my head completely around it mechanically, but since I have uh, 14 of these to finish up, I might give that a go. Because I was supposed to put this demonstration on for my club and it didn't happen. And I'm not just going to leave them around partially done. I have a few spares in case we get to a point that's something catastrophic happens. We're going to try to avoid that. But you never can tell. But basically, you would be cutting in like that and then attempting to get that piece out. You need a pretty sharp, thin bladed knife, I would say. And anytime I've tried thin bladed knives, I've usually broke the tip off of them. I've got four Drake knives to prove that point. Um, and I was even being easy on them and I took the tips off. So I need to, sorry about bumping the camera, folks. Need to clean that off a little bit. I have permission from the wife to do that in case anybody's wondering. She's being unusually quiet in the living room. Hey, Ray, can you tell us the guy's name again that um, you were watching on YouTube? Somebody's asking in the chat. Uh, Ruben Llanos, and it's a Spanish spelling. So the Y sound in the beginning is a double L. Um, he even answers questions if you have them. I wanted to send him a picture of my eyes. I couldn't figure out how to do that on YouTube. So, but he, uh, very, very personable gentleman. He's uh, Spanish, and I believe he's in Spain. I'm not absolutely positive about that. But due to time change, I wouldn't expect an instant response from him. That's what I'm saying. 
as you can see, the gouges get smaller and smaller. Little ones slide through there a whole lot easier. I'd like to thank Dave for inspiring me to uh, break out a sketch pad and try my hand at drawing instead of just trying to carve stuff out. I uh, learned a lesson from a supervisor I had in a company I worked with 31 years when I was in a position to repair a machine that I could not get to with my talented right hand. I could only get to it with my left hand. And some welding was involved and I, I looked up at him and I said, Rudy, I can't, I can't get this. It's, I can't weld it can't reach it with only my left hand. He said, same brain controls your right hand and your left hand, weld it left-handed. I did a rather ugly weld, held till we got to a maintenance day. But from then on, I practiced with my left hand and I never used, let the fact that I couldn't get somewhere with the correct hand to hold me back. I don't carve with my left hand, by the way. I tried that the other night for a left-handed carver. That was ugly. I'd need a lot of practice. But he uh, let me know that tool is a tool, paintbrush, knife, whatever. You know, you write your name, you should be able to with enough practice to do this hobby. Because if you think about all of the work that goes into just signing your name in script and you don't even think about it when you do it, the only difference is the pen doesn't cut you when it slips. You have to make the decision to give it a try, which I didn't for many, many years. First time I attempted this, I was 12. I'm in my 60s now and I only tried it seriously three years ago. Cutting the wrong way. Now, when you get down this small, you will definitely feel all of that hollow stuff moving in your hand that's holding. Try to support that as best you can, but not squeeze it too much because it's definitely delicate. A little bit too big a bite. You get down here and you don't push it. You basically take what the carving gives you. And please don't try to carve it, what I'm considering a breakneck pace right now. It's supposed to be fun, it's not a drag race. I don't normally call this fast. I basically use whichever tool I think I can get in there with and do what I need to do.
I probably made about 25 of these, I think. I've been very fortunate. I haven't broke one yet. I have carved into a check, repaired it with glue. I don't consider that a break if it is grown there naturally. That was bad. Santa almost got even with me for bragging. All of this inside of this spiral will have to be cleaned up very carefully because of the twist. It's very hard to think you're working on one section, but the tip of your knife is over on the other side doing something, let's say, totally unexpected. Um, I've had it uh, tickle a palm of my hand on occasion because you're focusing on where you're cutting. You're not focusing on the entire length of the blade. Um, it's just all kinds of safety things to kind of pay attention to. It's very important that you actually flip this thing over when you're cutting on this side of the piece because your grain is running up to it and you want to shear through it. You don't want to pull it apart, especially when it's this small. And if you get a little, you see I'm getting a little carried away here. You can very easily slice through your project. You may have to slow down a little bit here. It just, it's tough cutting when the, the stuff is in there, but as you get out onto what's already been carved, you can feel it change and uh, start to cut much nicer or quicker, let's say. Makes little crunching noises and all kinds of entertaining stuff that's letting you know you're starting to get in a little bit of trouble. I've never gotten this far into a spiral in this little time ever. I don't know if you noticed, but I used my thumb to locate where I was cutting on that piece. So I didn't switch rings or spirals. So you end up working in the same area that you cut on one side. Just little things you have to pay attention to.
Sorry. Hey, Ray, have you tried to carve them in anything other than basswood? I just wondered if the grain uh, and other woods would be even harder to carve than it would be just in the regular basswood block. Uh, to be honest with you, no, I haven't tried it. I have a one that I got started in walnut, and the face is kind of kicking my butt right now, but I haven't really attacked it with any kind of gusto. Um, it, I do find it a little tough for the carve in uh, its black walnut. I would think that butternut wouldn't be too bad. I haven't done a lot of carving in it, but I was vitally impressed at how nicely that did carve. But I don't know how well the open grain is going to, uh, you'd have to really pay attention, <clears throat> excuse me, to cutting cross grain in that, um, I would think. I would not give it a try on rock maple, I can tell you that right now. I don't even like playing in rock maple with a hand plane. Making a cutting board or something like that. Whenever I'm carving a, uh, <clears throat> a round stop cut like that, I like to use what carvers like Mary May who uh, use mallets. When they do a carving, they have a, a sweep to every gouge that usually does their curves. It um, makes for a lot smoother transition. The actual first thing I tried to carve was a rosette in my uh, daughter's baby cradle. I made that out of walnut. I'm sure Blake would like that. Uh, successfully got the rosette in there, but it was all done with the sweep of the tool. And the uh, size of the rosette was determined by the size of the chisels. My father taught me how to do that. I am gonna invest in some veiners to see if that makes this any easier. Cause I believe I'm just beating the, the jabbers out of my uh, dockyard tools. Although they do take a beating and keep on ticking. Always pay attention to have the neck blade facing in the correct direction. Kind of breaking the rules right there, cutting against the grain, but kind of hard to make a stop cut down, to finish the cut to the bottom of the groove with nothing to hold on to. I didn't want any of you thinking I was a hypocrite. We're always with that one. <clears throat> I would not suggest leaving that much wood to take off, the rest of that being hollow. 
That was not a clever move on my part. I got greedy. Say, Ray, do you ever start at the bottom and work your way up on the spiral? No, haven't tried that yet. I'm, uh, I'm kind of like a railway. I get on a set of tracks and it's a little hard to derail me. Um, sometimes it's a blessing. A lot of times it's a curse. Um, I tell all my coworkers about that shortcoming of mine and ask them to use dynamite because sometimes it pays to listen to someone else and come up with a lot better idea. And that'll be something I might try because like I said, I got 16 or so of these to finish. <clears throat> it's not something I'm overly proud of, but it's a shortcoming I'm well aware of. Ooh, that was a crack. It was a good crack. You can see the amount of work that went into getting this spiral here, why I don't work on the face first. I do have a, a friend of mine at my carving club who does carve the face first, but he's been carving probably almost as long as I've been alive. And I would say he's a much better carver than I am. Bad noise, bad noise. See how that gouge gets a little tight down here. There's a little bit more wood in there to remove than that little, I think that's a, I wonder if it's tight, that's a five. I got a four, it's a little less room. But the other smaller gouges, penetrating a little bit too much and not taking out what I've cut loose. Worry about hitting the camera. Hope nobody had vertigo. No choice. Come on. Occasionally talk to my work. It hasn't answered me back yet. 
Hey, Ray, I don't want to rush you. We're coming up on about 15 after four. Um, do you want to just talk through how you usually finish those up and uh, what your process is from here? Well, that is what it looks like when he's basically done, except for a little more cleanup here on the bottom. Then I install the face, um, get that all done, carve in my mustache, which would go. Um, I always use a downturn mustache because the only one I know. It's another thing I have to work on. I don't give him much of a mouth on this because I think the impressive part is the here. But I put the eyes in about there. <clears throat> Round off the house, the hat, of course, and I put a ball on the back of them. Similar to that. Um, and then V groove in the uh, beard. I paint on the eyes because I'm not good enough with eyes to make an eye that small yet. Hopefully one day I will. That mustache is crooked as hell. And like I said, I use the uh, acrylic paints, full strength, and then an antiquing medium. But I do want to learn how to do the layering of the paint. I'm taking lessons on it. So that part of the carving, I'm the worst at. Those are hot. And I have a little Dremel set up to drum a hole for the screw eyes. And that is about it. Anybody have any questions? All right, Ray. Well, that uh, that seems to be um, all the questions that are out there. Um, thanks for taking time out to show us that. Uh, okay. Very tedious work there. Um, yeah, I'm glad you didn't cut yourself because I think everybody was sitting by watching to make sure you didn't. Um, Double goal. At this point, I... I think we're going to go ahead and do the drawing for the giveaway for the Wood Carving Academy uh, certificate for the one month subscription. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tom and he's going to do that drawing live here on the meeting. All right. Thanks, Blake. And uh, thanks, Ray. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, let me just share my screen here. All right. Can you guys see that? All right, we had 147 people enter this, so that's fantastic. Thanks for everyone who entered. And number 15 is on another screen, bear with me. Sorry, Blake, you're going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to figure that one out. Just give me a second. I've lost that screen. Well, I'll, I'll tell everybody about Wood Carbon Academy. Make sure you go out and check out Wood Carbon Academy. Uh, recent um, workshops that's uh, been held are, are being put out there on a regular basis. Uh, so if you missed a class that you wanted to participate in, you weren't able to do it live. Some of those videos are going out there now. I know Yaron's working hard to try to get that updated. Uh, and get all the information out there. There's also uh, past classes that you can go out and check out. Uh, so make sure you go to woodcarbonacademy.com. Um, you can do subscriptions there. It's uh, one month, three months, or a year. Uh, the year is the most uh, uh, most value filled because um, it, it's less than if you you know calculate a one month subscription, multiply it by 12. Uh, and you get a lot of content there. I go out on a regular basis and check out past classes and other videos that are available. So make sure you go out and check that out. Again, I, I know uh, Dave Stetson has classes on there, uh, Kevin Applegate, uh, Dwayne Gosnell. There's a lot of recent classes. I know Ryan Olson's out there. So uh, some good material. Bob Hershey's on the meeting today. His are out there as well. So uh, make sure you go out and check that out. Try to sign up if you get a chance and uh, uh, take advantage of these classes. It's a whole lot better than having to travel and get uh, a hotel room. Uh, and stay somewhere, you know, out of town for four or five days to take a class. So check it out. Uh, Tom, you ready now? Yeah, Blake, our winner is uh, Jonathan Schulman, and I will be in touch by email, Jonathan. Okay, we'll uh, get a certificate out to him, and uh, we'll be doing another one of these drawings. Um, Yaron's been uh, generous to donate two of these, so we'll be doing another one in coming weeks. Uh, we'll do the same sign-up, and hopefully that works out for everybody going out and signing up online. 
I uh, just want to remind you all about the presentations that we have coming up coming weeks. Uh, one of the recent people that we signed up, uh, we signed up Cam Merkel from Razor Tip. Uh, that's the wood burning uh, business. Uh, he's going to be coming on next week and be doing a demonstration on wood burning. And I know some people have an interest in that. Um, I've, I've seen their um, machines. I actually have one and uh, they come to the Charlotte show and set up on occasion uh, or they have somebody there. And uh, those those uh, burning machines are really great. So uh, come on next week and see Cam Merkel come on and do a live demonstration. Uh, on April the 2nd, Steve Tomashek's coming on. He does miniatures. So that'll be something uh, different and interesting that we haven't had before. Uh, Joe Yu is going to come on on April the 9th. If you don't know Joe, he's a CCA member. He's going to come on and talk about doing um, um, clay models um, to try to get motion in your carvings. Uh, and how you transfer the clay over to a pattern and be able to uh, set those carvings up. So make sure you join us on April the 9th uh, to see Joe Yu. Again, Chris Hammock's coming on to talk about the uh, carving the Rockies um, that's coming up in September. So he'll be on April the 16th. Uh, Brad Andrews is coming on on April the 23rd. Uh, Cecilia Schiller, uh, who is the crank lady. Again, if you haven't seen her work, go out on Instagram, check it out. It's some amazing stuff. Uh, she'll be coming on on April the 30th. Uh, Ken Kuhar, who's on with us today, and hopefully I didn't slaughter his last name. Uh, he signed up with us recently. He's coming on on May the 7th. Uh, and then Dana from the Carving Junkie, she's on with us today. She's coming on on May the 14th. So uh, we have quite the lineup coming up uh, at least through the middle of May. We'll be signing up other people. Uh, make sure you join us for any of those that you might uh, be available to come on. Again, we come on every Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to share with other carvers. Uh, hopefully, you're taking advantage of these. If you're missing any of the meetings, you can go back and watch all those on YouTube. Uh, so make sure you go out and like and subscribe on our YouTube page. Uh, we also have some quick cuts. So if you're not able to watch the whole uh, meeting, you can go out and watch some of the quick cuts that we have on YouTube. Uh, that gives you some good tips and information about carving on there. So check that out. I uh, want to thank you all again for coming on today. Again, this is the International Association of Woodcarvers, where woodcarvers are helping woodcarvers. And we'll see you all next Saturday with Razor Tip at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ray, thanks again for coming on, and we'll see you all soon. Great.